something big. It's obvious that you're all here today because you all believe that at some stage in your lives, you're going to be involved in something big. Well, the discovery of the hepatitis C virus shown here and the ability in a short period of time, less than 25 years, to create a cure that can possibly reach as many as 200 million people around the world is certainly something big. It's something big for science. It's something big for medicine. It's something big for our patients. But it also has huge implications in terms of how we're going to think today a little bit about finance, about the cost of medications, and also about the global impact of the things that we do as basic scientists, researchers, clinical translational scientists that really can impact a lot of people. So the story for me, because this is all about a story, really started back in the late 1980s. Now, this is not just my story. There are hundreds of groups of scientists and researchers, both in academia and in industry, who have worked on hepatitis C virus. Most importantly, this is the story of our patients, the many, many thousands of patients who volunteered to help us understand and defeat this disease. They gave their blood, they gave their tissues, they gave their time, and they gave their efforts to try to find a cure for this disease. Now, back in the late 1980s, I first met a patient. Let's call him Larry. And Larry came in to me, he was in his late 30s, and he had led a fairly hard life. He drank a lot of alcohol, he had smoked heavily, used a bit of IV drugs, and he had fairly advanced liver disease and cirrhosis. He was actually in very bad shape, and he, we made the diagnosis that he had a viral infection called non-A, non-B. Whenever you call something non-something, you really don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> so he had this non-A, non-B, and there was a treatment at the time that we were using for a disease we didn't really know what it was. So that's always tough. And we decided we would put him on this interferon treatment, and we gave it to Larry. But Larry didn't do well. In fact, Larry died. And you have to put this into context in terms of what was happening in the US in the late 1980s. The late 1980s was the, was the period where HIV AIDS was really, really rampant. Our hospitals, at the time I was at the Boston City Hospital, was full of patients. Most of them were dying of AIDS. And all of the resources, and when I say all of the resources, that means the research, the money, was going to trying to cure HIV. But there were a few small groups that actually were looking at hepatitis C. One of those small groups was out in Los Angeles, led by Michael Houghton. And Michael was a very smart guy. Normally, you discover a virus by looking at it. You take a microscope and you look and you see the virus in the smear of blood or whatever tissue you're looking at. But nobody could visualize this non-A, non-B hepatitis. So what Michael did was he made an assumption, and he and his team said, look, if a human being gets a virus, they must have a response to that virus. They must make something like an antibody to fight that virus. And so what he said was, all right, I'm going to take this non-A, non-B virus and put it in the only model we had, which was a chimpanzee. So he put the virus into the chimpanzee, and then over a six-year period, he did an amazing thing back 30 years ago, and that is he took out hundreds and hundreds of millions of clones, the entire genetic material of that chimpanzee, and he put them on plates. And then he took a patient who had non-A, non-B hepatitis, and he screened those plates, all those hundreds of millions of clones, and he came up with one hit one hit, one clone, and that was it. That was the hepatitis C virus. And being a very smart scientist, he knew there was a hepatitis A, he knew there was a hepatitis B, and so he called it hepatitis C, <laughs> which is okay. But really what happened with this discovery was that the era of real research in hepatitis C could begin. This virus actually is very similar to a virus that's in the news all the time. It's the same family as the Zika virus. 
Now, once we knew what the virus is, I'll give you a quote from one of my favorite movies, The Last Samurai. And in The Last Samurai, change is taking place in Japan. And one of the samurai says, you must know one's enemy to beat one's enemy. Well, once this virus was discovered, we were able to create antibodies against the virus, we were able to sequence the virus and measure the virus in the blood, and then we were able to study what is hepatitis C, who does it affect, what does it do, and what diseases does it cause, because we all thought this was a very, very rare disease. We didn't know back in, in, in 1989 the true scope of this problem. So it turns out, that we obviously knew that it was caused by blood transfusion. Uh, but we didn't know what the scale of this was. And let me give you an example of that scale. And it's the story, as we like to call it in the medical world, of the Irish women. I'm married to an Irish woman, so it's not her story. But what it is a story about is a story about a group of pregnant Irish women who had what we call rhesus immunoglobulin mismatch. And this is where there's a difference in the rhesus allele between the mother and the fetus. And so to prevent an injury taking place to the baby, you inoculate the mother with rhesus immunoglobulin. So the blood bank system didn't know what non-A, non-B, so-called hepatitis C now was, so they took a sample from a single person in London, and they gave it to 1,000 pregnant women almost 80% of them got hepatitis C. Didn't know about it. Didn't know about it until the virus was discovered many, many years later. And so you can see how the potential for the spread of this virus is amazing. And what you see here is what our epidemiologists show as the global prevalence rates across the world. One to two percent of the world's population has hepatitis C. Larry, who I thought was a rare patient, is incredibly common. And it turns out that of these 200 million people, more than half of them don't even know they have the virus. And this lets them progress their disease silently. And the other name for hepatitis C has always been the silent killer. Now, you can see on this map that there are areas where there's really a lot of hepatitis C. The one that comes to mind right there in the red is Egypt. Now, how did Egypt actually end up with as much as 10% of its population or almost 12 million people having hepatitis C. Well, it turns out that in the 1950s and 60s, there was a worm in Egypt along the Nile River called schistosomiasis. This flatworm caused a fairly nasty disease involving the liver and the bladder. So to get rid of this, the government did what they thought was a great idea, and they started a program to vaccinate against schistosomiasis. As it turns out, they did really well. They got rid of schistosomiasis. Now, 30 years later, they have the largest epidemic of hepatitis C in the world because they actually spread hepatitis C throughout the Nile Delta. So we began to know all about this, who has the disease. We also began to understand the disease. And it turns out that hepatitis C is the commonest cause of cirrhosis, liver cancer, and the most common requirement or the most common cause for liver transplantation in the world. So this disease carries a significant morbidity and mortality. Again, things that we didn't know when I first started in this area. So uh, we now know that this is a highly impactful, very important disease. And we were, at the same time as understanding the disease, trying to figure out how to treat the disease. Now, if you go back to Larry, I told you I treated him with a medicine called interferon. So, when you get the flu, and I'm sure many of you have had the flu this season so fast, you feel pretty what? Pretty crummy. You feel sick, you get the shakes, you feel, you know, blah, your muscles ache. That's the flu. Well, interferon is what your body is making when you get the flu. It's a protein that you secrete to fight and combat viral infections. So, what we did was we decided that we would give patients huge doses of interferon. And over a long period of time, interferon was our only treatment for hepatitis C. We hated it. It made people feel bad. Only about half of the patients could take it. Many dropped out after they took the interferon. And it really was a tough, tough cure. But while we were treating these patients with interferon, our scientists made two amazing new discoveries. First, they created a model that wasn't a chimpanzee, it was actually a cell system where we could study the virus. And then they figured out something 
that's really interesting. Hepatitis C is a dumb, stupid virus. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, for most viruses, if you want to survive and be a chronic infection, you have to hide yourself. You have to lay yourself down. But hepatitis C was like the ever-ready bunny. It just kept going and going and going and going, and the only way it survived was to keep copying itself millions and millions of times. Once we knew this and we knew the structure of the virus, we were able to move on. And what happened was that industry became very interested in this disease. And we started to look at multiple different new treatments for hepatitis C. I call this the Milky Way of drug development back in 2010. And we had over 100 different drugs that we were involved with in clinical trials. And guess what? 95% of them failed. They were either too toxic or they weren't good enough. But in 2011, and I'm going to do this just like my friend Ed Gain from Australia did. At one of our big international conferences, there was a breakthrough. Now, we'd never cured anybody without interferon, and we've been trying all of these different drugs to do this. So what Ed did was he designed a trial, and in this trial, he had people that were going to be treated for 12 weeks. Some of them were going to get this new drug, which here is called PSI-7977, with interferon for 12 weeks, interferon for eight weeks, interferon for four weeks, and then a group of people were going to get this drug by itself with no interferon. And he didn't know what was going to happen. And to cut a long story short, all of the patients were cured. This was perhaps the only time I've ever sat in a, in a medical conference where everybody went, ah. Oh. They couldn't believe it. For the first time, tablets had cured hepatitis C. And once you, once you start uh, on this pathway, it snowballs very aggressively. Now, I don't know how many of you have been involved in developing pharmaceuticals or drugs, but the average time from the discovery of a drug to its development is between seven and 10 years. Now, this is 2011. By 2014, we had combined drugs and done the clinical trials and presented the data that resulted in a treatment for hepatitis C that could cure 95% of patients with one tablet once a day that was simple, safe, and effective. This was an incredible feat of, uh, of medicine. We could now go out there and reap all the glories of having created what literally was called a wonder drug. And we were expecting tremendous accolades. We didn't get any. We didn't get anything. In fact, the conversation changed. And the conversation changed because this turned out to be what I'm sure you've all heard about, the $1,000 a day pill. That's a lot of money for a single tablet. In fact, that makes one tablet of sofosbuvir, as it's called, the most expensive substance on Earth. 400 milligrams for $1,000. $150,000 for some patients to be cured. I tell my patients, hey, I'm going to give you a Maserati. Here's the down payment. And you know, the reality is, is that that's a very, very high cost. And what it did was rather than, you know, embrace the great advances that had taken place in understanding this, it changed the dialogue. And the dialogue became one of what is the appropriate cost of medicine? Now, this treatment is highly cost-effective. It's worth $150,000 to cure any one individual patient, because that patient won't go on to develop liver cancer, liver failure, need a liver transplant. So when economists look at this, it's highly cost-effective. But when you have to pay for this type of medicine, it becomes a little more difficult. And so who's to blame? Well, there was a Senate hearing that took place in the U.S. Uh, looking at the high cost of drugs, driven particularly by these drugs. There was a huge debate in our presidential election year about who can pay for and what are the costs of drugs and what is the pharmaceutical industry doing. These are all concepts that are very good to think about. But imagine, imagine this. Imagine I'm sitting in this chair. And you're my patient. Or you're my patient's mother. You can be whoever you want. And I sit there next to you and I say, hi. I have a cure for hepatitis C. But guess what? You can't have it. You can't have it because no one will pay for it. And in fact, that's a conversation 
that we have almost 10 times a week with our patients. And so for the first time, rationing of medications has taken place in the US. A difficult thing for us to swallow. Now, what about the world? You know, here we are talking about a rich country where we're already talking about healthcare being rationed. What about the world? Well, we've learned a lot from the HIV days. You know, HIV treatments first came out in the US. They were used to treat US patients with HIV. But today, now, more and more patients, in fact, by far the greater majority of patients, are being treated with these medicines in the developing world, especially in Africa. And you can see the price of HIV medicines, which was in the thousands of dollars when they came out, is down at $3.50. The truth is that rich countries pay the high premium for pharmaceuticals to go and be able to give them to other countries. Now, the great news about this is that, in fact, this is happening immediately with hepatitis C. Generic manufacturers approved by the pharmaceutical industry have plants in India, China, creating generic hepatitis C drugs that will be used to treat the millions of patients that are out there in India, in Pakistan, in Egypt. There are incredible programs going on around the world today. These programs include elimination programs. One fantastic program is in, uh, is in Georgia, the, state, the Republic of Georgia, where the government and the people have come together to try to eliminate hepatitis C from Georgia. These are really great advances, and we're learning from these. We have a program in Africa, in Rwanda, where we're doing what we call stick and treat. We're taking patients, doing a finger stick on their finger, detecting the hepatitis C virus in their blood, and giving them treatment immediately. When you can cure 99% of people, you really don't need a lot of sophisticated testing or expensive follow-up. And what this really means to us is that will we have an opportunity over the next 10 to 20 years to really combat hepatitis C worldwide? The answer is yes, but only if everybody pulls their weight. Right now, Industry, the people that make the drugs, are very pro a global elimination strategy. Academia is for it. And what we're having to pull into this is to get the governments and the politicians to agree. If we can do that, then this last 25 years where I think we did something big may well turn out to be something enormous. Thank you very much.